Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. Today we're going to explore Ingo Swann's mysterious book, Penetration. Many of you will know that Ingo Swann is often regarded as the father of remote viewing, and his book, Penetration, has to do with the mystery of UFOs. And of course, there are many other facets of Ingo Swann's remarkable life related to UFOs. My guest today is Daz Smith. He is the publisher of the Eight Martinis magazine for the remote viewing community. He is also author of several books, including Surfing the Psychic Internet, Remote Viewing Dialogues, CRV, Controlled Remote Viewing, and Remote Viewing 911. Daz is based in the United Kingdom, and now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Daz. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Hi, yeah, and thanks for having me along. It's uh, it's great to be here. I'm a great admirer of your work. Thank you. Well, we're going to be talking about Ingo Swan today. I've done other programs about Ingo Swan. I know he's somebody you met with personally. And I guess uh, for our viewers who may not be familiar with Ingo, it would be fair to say that he's almost universally regarded as the father of remote viewing, even though that might be somewhat misleading. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Uh Although he, he, you know, when when you asked him this question, he always, uh, he always said the the real father was uh, Harold Putoff, his, uh, his, you know, his co-founder in it, really. Um, but yes, he's known around the world as the uh, the father of remote viewing. Of course, to me, remote viewing is just simply uh, what we used to call free response clairvoyance, and and that's been around for many many decades before Ingo Swan and Hal Putoff and uh, the team at the SRI and SAIC came on the scene. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, you know, I think what Ingo uh, added to, to the previous experiments was he, uh, he added that we should all practice what we were doing more scientifically within the scientific protocol. And that's what makes, you know, remote viewing different from what I call the classical techniques, yeah. You've been involved in remote viewing now yourself for several decades. Yeah, I'm uh, 24 years going on 25 years uh, as as we speak. Yes, uh, practicing you know pretty much every day, definitely every week. And for the last four years, uh, one of the, one of the very few on the planet uh, full time paid remote viewers as well, which is very impressive. Uh, and I know you're working in, in the area of uh, forecasting financial trends, particularly in the Bitcoin market. Yep, yep. Cryptos, uh, we do the gold markets as well and the, and the other markets, you know, the S&P 500 and stuff. But generally cryptos and news predictions as well. Yep. And you also had the pleasure of visiting Ingo Swan at his home in New York City. Yes, I did. Um, in 2011, Ingo invited me to stay for a week. I only stayed for the day in the end because he was um, he was getting quite ill at that point. Um, but it was um, yeah, I have to say it was a magical experience. Um, walking into Ingo's and then seeing you know being surrounded by his artwork and all his files and books. Yeah, that was a pretty that was a pretty amazing experience for someone like me who has uh, been in engrossed and a you know really interested in this subject for two, over two decades. You had hundreds of questions that you wanted to ask Ingo, and I imagine you did ask as many as you could in, in the time that you had. Yes, yes, we covered all subjects. Uh, I wanted to ask quite a lot of questions myself about the uh, the history of CRV because um, it's still quite fragmented, you know, the entire history of RV and CRV. And, I, you know, I spent many years now trying to piece that together through freedom of information documents 
but I also wanted to ask him questions as well related to the latest article that I just put out uh, and about you know his book uh, Penetration and his his alleged uh, remote viewing of, of the moon for in, intelligence agencies. Well, Ingo is really famous for having used remote viewing to visit the moon, Jupiter, uh, Mercury, I think, uh, Mars, uh, prior to the various NASA space probes. And uh, for coming up using remote viewing with accurate information about those planets that was not known by the astronomical community at the time. Yeah. Yeah, Inga did some great work on that. I call it explorative work, um, and not not enough is done with, with that in remote viewing to this day. So I'm hoping to reignite that. Um, but yeah, he started off with Jupiter in 1973, then moved on to Mercury in 74, the Moon in 75. Then he went back to Mars uh, three, uh, actually four times in uh, 1975, 1976, twice, and then he went back in 1984 with a larger project uh, with his best student uh, in the CRV technology, Tom McNear, and that was that was a pretty spectacular project that Tom recently presented at Irva this year. It was well known, it was quite public that Ingo seemed to be able to use remote viewing or what some people then were calling traveling clairvoyance to visit other planets and to accurately describe technical details about those planets. That was public information. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Ingo's, uh, Ingo did some great work, for example, on, on Jupiter, uh, describing things that weren't thought of in science uh, before he actually described them. And uh, if anyone's interested uh, in the University of West Georgia, in their archives, which they're just putting online, uh, the archives of all the Ingo Swan the Files, there is a very detailed uh, report in there uh, of all, all Ingo's observations and it's really interesting because uh, over the years, has he got more feedback? Because, you know, he explored it before any, any probes have gone there. But over the years, as he gathered more evidence and feedback, he color coded it in, in this document. And it's really, really exciting to see in his own hand. I'm pretty sure that one of the findings he came up with was the idea that there were rings around Jupiter. Yes, yes, he, yes, he did, yes. Now, his book, Penetration, which uh, we'll be talking about, is very mysterious to most people. Not that there's a anything uh, mysterious in the book itself. It's very straightforward. But the phenomena that he claims he observed and reports on in that book seems so out of the ordinary, one might even say bizarre, that I think many people, including myself, have a hard time believing it on the same time a hard time disbelieving it yeah absolutely and um and when i was you know face to face with ingo i asked i asked him questions about that book and one of them was that very question i literally said you know it's it's when you read the book it does read like a fantastical story uh, and you know a lot of people find it hard to believe and he, you know, he straight faced me and Ingo sat there and all the time he sat there, he, he had a big cigar and he, you know, he was puffing on his big cigar uh, and he, you know, he bent forward and he looked me straight in the eye and he said, if you think it's fantastic, how do you think it felt for me going through the entire process? He left me with, uh, he left me with no, uh, no other idea of the situation than, you know, it was all a genuine experience to him. And we'll talk about it in some detail, but before we get into it, I think it's fair to say that the people who knew Ingo intimately, people who studied uh, Ingo's remarkable clairvoyant abilities, people who were his students and friends, have all acknowledged that this man was a straight shooter. He was not the type of person to fabricate a story. Absolutely, yeah. I asked, I asked all, all, you know, as many friends and colleagues as I, I could find, and I even tracked down some colleagues that a lot of people didn't know about, really close friends of Ingo's who worked on the same projects, coincidentally as well, for, uh, for the penetration people. And you know, everyone to a T said, and you know, I know this from meeting him as well. He wasn't a con the kind of person to make things up or to lie or even exaggerate things. Uh, yeah, he was a very straight shooter. And, of course, he worked very closely with scientists. So let's talk about the uh, story itself that Ingo tells in this book, because I'm pretty sure most of our viewers haven't had the opportunity to read it yet. 
Essentially, Ingo details that whilst he was working at SRI, he was approached by uh, a man he calls uh, Mr. Axelrod, uh, obviously a shooter name for someone. Um, and Axelrod had, had some very strange bodyguards, which were like two twins, very special forces looking uh, young gentlemen. And they took him on several trips to an underground facility. Ingo was blindfolded, but he, he, he kind of observed over time that he felt like it might have been somewhere in Alaska, just from some of the things that happened on the trip. And so whilst he was there in Alaska, he was asked to remote view uh, locations on the moon. And Ingo then described you know very strange structures on the moon. And later on as well in the book, Ingo details how they also took him on a trip to a location. Again, he feels that it was in Alaska, whereby he saw a UFO uh, shaped craft materialize. And if I remember correctly, it, it sort of came out of a lake. Yes, that's correct. Yes, yes. Uh, obviously, uh, it, you know, it got to be quite a dangerous situation, or it appeared to in the book, because Ingo said that they, uh, it was recognised that they were there watching, so they had to scarper and run through the forest pretty fast to escape. In, in other words, this object, we'll call it a UFO, was attacking them. It seemed it seemed to be the case. That's what Ingo seems to indicate in the book. Yes, absolutely. He even claims he was injured. Yes, yes. Uh, he, he details that he was running for the uh, the woods, and uh, he wasn't a very athletic uh, person at this time. And yeah, he did he did injure himself a little bit. In other words, the gist of the story is that there's some sort of a, a secret organization. It's not even clear who they are, but they seem to know a lot about UFO activity right here on this planet. And they were able to bring Ingo to a remote location, a lake somewhere in the northern uh, woods, probably Alaska, where he witnessed a UFO you say materializing, but as I recall, it sort of rose out of the water from a lake. Yes, absolutely. And um, it's not that fantastical uh, now nowadays if people do research into the UFO field because it's a pretty common story. UFOs are you know commonly reported near uh, big bodies of water, and you know we have now over the last couple of years the uh, the infamous uh, Nimitz Tic Tac UFO event as well. And the latest piece of footage, we actually have one of those descending down uh, under the surface of the water as well. In your new issue of Eight Martinis, you go into Ingo's exploration of potential ET contacts on the Earth. You include, for example, an old 1992 article that Ingo wrote for Fate magazine. And in that article, he issues a call. He says... He implies that these aliens are obviously very psychic. Every time a, an abduction is reported or a contact experience is reported, the people, the bewildered people who come out of these experiences say, they communicated with me telepathically. And he, he wonders, why is it that they seem to be so psychic in an hour human culture here on earth there seems to be a large scale effort all across the planet to suppress psychic functioning to deny that it even exists and he wonders if the aliens aren't the ones behind this that they don't want us to develop uh, abilities to the same degree that they have and he's urging readers of his article to move beyond that to develop what he called the ability to penetrate the UFO enigma. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And he goes into detail on it as well uh, under, a, uh, under a heading called psychic castration. Uh, and he details, you know, how he feels that this has gone on probably for, for centuries, you know, and in part we've done it to ourselves, but maybe we've been guided in that process, you know, cause uh, in the, in Europe here, we have the, you know, the witch trials, anyone that showed any, part of an intuitive ability for many many eons were you know burns at the stake and put through many horrible deaths and you know in in later society right now we have religions that are you know holding people back with intuitive faults and even society to a larger degree and yeah he, he does detail that he feels that there may be an alien or i, I don't like to call it alien i like to call it non-human because we don't know what they are yet um, but there is a non-human presence that seem to be uh manipulating us especially when they have contacts with uh 
with humans, uh, you know, which we tend to call abductions nowadays. And Ingo seemed to be quite convinced back in 1992 that the alien presence uh, has been on Earth for a very, very long time, and that we were probably uh, the result of a genetic engineering program conducted by these non-humans going back, I don't know, maybe 50,000 years or so. And he also suggests that they have a mining operation going on on the moon. Yes, yes. Um, and that makes sense. Uh, you know, we know, there are, we know the moon's rich in all kinds of uh, minerals and materials. Um, so that makes great sense. And go, again, going back since the dawn of telescopes and, you know, astronomers, we have reports of lights and all kinds of activity on the moon. And we, you know... To add to all this as well, uh, I've been looking at this now, this whole Moon-Mars situation with uh, remote viewing for over two decades, and I can count literally hundreds of remote viewers under many different circumstances and blind conditions. All of them seem to report on on both Moon and and the Mar and Mars uh, structures and activity, which seem to indicate mining and and other facilities that are there doing stuff. Well, I thought it was very interesting that. You published two articles by Ingo that came out in Fate magazine. In 1992, he's urging the readers to join him in a new movement to penetrate the alien enigma and uh, to find out through remote viewing what these aliens are really up to. And then... In the second article, he goes on a different tack, it seems to me. He, he's suggesting that if you do remote viewing without the opportunity to have physical feedback, so you know whether your uh, vision under remote viewing is accurate or not, you're not really doing remote viewing at all. You're deviating from the scientific protocol, and obviously that would apply to almost all efforts to uh, penetrate the UFO enigma through remote viewing. Absolutely, yeah. And he does remark in the same article that, the, you know, he, he's he's part of this situation as well because he's been involved in doing these experiments. But yeah, it's uh, it's an enigma. And uh, as we know from, you know, from articles that go on after this, in his work after this, Ingo did go on to do what I would call non-blind remote viewing uh, and remote viewing of these areas like the moon uh, with no physical feedback. Um, So yeah, he did that at the same time. So it's very contradictory what he's saying there. Um, But I can understand why he's, he's saying it like that. And I would add that it helps as a remote viewer, and you know, if you're someone like Ingo, for example, Ingo did over a million uh, experiments uh, in scientific conditions, so he has a very established track record of accuracy that you can kind of use as as a gauge is to his accuracy. You know, if he's going a bit in left field and doing a, a front-loaded, uh, what I would call esoteric type target. Let's talk about uh, what front loading means for the benefit of our viewers who won't know that term. Absolutely, yeah. The majority of remote viewing is done blind, and in in, in the process, and that is, uh, there's usually a tasker that's uh, remote from you as a remote viewer, and they set up a task. So they might write down on a sheet or paper, or or type into their computer. I want Daz to to visit the moon uh, and then they'll assign that a random number and all we get is the remote viewer is the random number so we know nothing about the target up front. In the case with some of the work that Ingo did, for example the one we're probably going to be discussing in in a while, um, the article that we found from uh, the transcript from 1999, Ingo knew that he would be going to the moon to look for something so yeah he he was what we call front loaded in that regard, he wasn't blind anymore. And the problem with front loading is that once the ego, the intellect gets involved, it it will develop all sorts of scenarios and and fantasies and strategies because the the intellect tries to figure all this out logically. Yeah, absolutely. It's a most people wouldn't believe this if they're not practicing remote viewers, but actually knowing a little bit about the target at front front loading. 
um, actually makes it a hell of a lot harder to do the target because your mind's so busy uh, trying to guess what the target is based on the sliver of information you've been given. So yeah, most of us as remote viewers hate front loading. Uh, although uh, I have worked some, uh, uh, some cases like I'd worked 250 uh, missing person cases for the, uh, all different police forces in the United States. And it's good to know I'm working a missing person case, although that doesn't tell me anything specific because it then allows me to tailor my RV information in a way so that I describe more locational details from because all the police want to know is the location. Um, so front loading can be good for operational use, but it's a, it's a very fine balance between how much f information is, is too much. Let's talk about uh, Ingo's visits to the moon. Uh, you found uh, detailed information in the files. I think you've talked to uh, Ingo's partner in uh, some of these adventures, uh, Bob Durant. And, and so you have quite a bit of information about it, uh, with the caveat that it potentially might all be fantasy. Absolutely. There's, uh, at this point in time... Um... As with most of the RV sessions that I've seen over the years on the moon, and I've collected quite a lot, um, we ha we do not have sufficient feedback yet to be to to verify the data. All we can say is, a lot of people and a lot of scientists uh, report anomalous phenomena on the moon. Um, you know, someone like me may have a very good accurate or an accuracy track level that you can take into into account as well. But until we get proper feedback, and I don't know when that may be coming, you have to uh, you, you have to take all the RV data with a pinch of salt, I believe. Ingo had these adventures. Let's let's begin by describing them. Yeah, absolutely. He, uh, he, Ingo was uh, it's, a, it's quite a complex situation because in the mid nineties, Ingo Swan kind of uh, he made friends and teamed up with a a UFO researcher, a quite prominent UFO researcher at a time called uh, Robert Durant or Bob Durant. And I think Ingo did have a bit of an interest before that, but what I think when they got together, Bob was the catalyst that really made Ingo uh, look at uh, what we call the uh, the ET or non-human intelligence kind of situation a bit more clearly with uh, with his RV. And from the letters and communications in the uh, in the Ingo Swan archives, going back and forth between Bob and Ingo, you can see this. Uh, communication and friendship really develop and, and, and blossom, uh, which then made Ingo also uh, reach out to people in the local area. So he went to uh, some of the UFO meetings and uh, gave talks in New Jersey to, to local UFO groups. And um, from that, they met a person called Richard Butler. Uh, I don't have a huge amount of details on Richard Butler other than he was another UFO researcher in the New York area at the time, in the mid-90s. Uh, and there are some notes that he might have been an abductee as well, a UFO abductee, abductee or experiencer. And Richard uh, was the client, and he, I guess he paid or he, uh, because he took the files when Ingo died, uh, and he said they were his. He paid for Bob and several others to work on several projects for, for him called the, the Luna Maris Project, looking at locations on and above the moon. I only have details of one of them. I have, I've had many conversations with Richard Butler, uh, and some of them are detailed in the, in the article, but he's very reluctant to release a lot of the information. And he seems to indicate that there are, there's an outside force of people that is telling him that he's not allowed to release a lot of the information. That's, um, adds to the mystery, I, I, I suppose. Well, I, I know in reading through the material, one of the phrases that kept coming up was DOMA, D-O-M-A. And, and it suggests that uh, DOMA represents a particular organization or group of non-humans who are functioning on the moon. I, I also gather that there's something feminine about DOMA. Yeah, yes. Uh, DOMA stands for the Daughters of Ma. Uh, and Richard Butler, uh, and I guess Ingo went on to believe this as well, and Bob Durant, are a group of extraterrestrial woman, uh, women that are kind of like, I guess, organizing con and controlling at some level everything in the in, in our local universe. Uh, he, uh, Richard also claims that they're working with our, our local governments here on Earth. Uh, and they're also, you know, they're also connected to us uh, through our DNA as well. And uh, it looks like they manipulated us in in some way where where their ancestors. So 
it's it's very strange and i have no you know like most things i have no information to back any of this up all i can say is uh ingo and bob seem to believe it and they took the lead from this and it led you know this this was the note that led them to go back to the moon uh, and they almost uh, and they detail it in the letters and in the document uh the doma gave ingo an invite to go to the moon and, and commune with them now i know all of this seems very fantastical but i can say from my own experience working in comparable situations doing remote viewing of this sort uh, with groups of people that oftentimes these scenarios that seem to be you know, fantasy turn out to be verifiable. Hopefully one day this will, this will too. Um, it's really interesting stuff. Um, and the good thing about it as well, we have what Ingo, we have this transcript now of this remote viewing. And um, what I'm hoping this will do over the next few years is because we have the coordinates that Ingo used for the moon as well. Uh, I'm hoping that myself and some other people that are interested and dedicated enough uh, might be able to also use this as a platform to do further research to take this to, to another level. So we shall we shall see. But yes, uh, I'm hoping that. So what what you found in the transcripts are actual audio tape. Uh, audio tapes that have been transcribed of Ingo reporting in real time what he is experiencing when his, you could say, his clairvoyant body or his astral body or his consciousness is is on the moon. He, he expects that he's been invited there by this uh, ET organization known as DOMA, the Daughters of Ma. Uh, but when he gets there, if I recall correctly, they kick him out. Uh, yes, uh, they, they kick him out. Uh, they don't kick him out this time, uh, but his, his very first visit, he was kicked out by a what he called a telepath, um, a male telepath. Uh, yes, and I think that uh, I think that angered Ingo somewhat, and that's what led him to want to come back for for this this transcript that we have, uh, which he and in in this transcript we do have, he does end up uh, summoning the. Uh, the being that originally kicked him out, and he does have quite an in-depth conversation with him, which is very interesting. So he's beginning to, at least in his own mind, learn about uh, what this DOMA organization is about. Yes, yes. It seems like they've been around for, I think they say something like 40,000 years, and they're on an exodus for, through the solar system in, these, in this huge mothership. And what's quite interesting as well, and uh, on the article itself, there's an illustration on the on the uh, on the page with the transcript, and that that illustration uh, is called MS15, and it used to be on Ingo Swan's website when it was up originally, um, and it's it was essentially a clue that Ingo hid in his original website, in hope that someone or, or I and mean, I guess this would be a remote viewer. They were hoping that a remote viewer would see that image of, and essentially it's a, it's a, it's a sketch of the, the solar system. And you might be able to show this in, in your video and around one of the planets, there's what looks like a, an object. And he's titled this MS 15. And I found out some details after Ingo died on, on this. And it was essentially a project Ingo did many years ago, different than this one here, but connected in some way where Ingo went to the farther reaches of the universe uh, and some of the planets, and he did find a huge mothership that was uh, orbiting one of the planets. And he was hoping that other remote viewers would take this hint. They would also do a project on it and send him information. But as I'm, as I'm aware of today, no one, no one actually hit the target or sent the right information in and, and got the hint on that one. Where do you think things ended up? Ingo died in a sh couple of years, as I recall, after you visited him in 2011. He died in 2013. Uh, do you have any sense of Ingo's final appraisal of the this human, uh, non-human interaction? No, this this is as far as I've got so far, this article. I do know there's more. Uh, we do know that after Ingo passed, uh, uh, Richard Butler, the guy, uh, the person that was the client for these Lunar Mars projects, did actually go to Ingo's house and speak to the estate. Uh, Ellie, who's Ingo's niece, is controlling that. Um, and he did take all the files that they worked on with this project. So he, he has quite a lot of files. 
I also know that there were some files in uh, in Bob Durant's files as well, but Bob Durant passed not long after as well. Um, so I've been tracking down his files. Um, I've tracked some down. Another remote viewer has a copy of those. Uh, and he might even have the audio tapes for these transcripts and even more audio tapes. Um, it's just trying to put the pieces of the puzzle together. So, no, I don't have a full picture at this stage other than I'm very aware that Ingo did many explorations. You know, I I have details about a big Roswell crash file that they did. And they had evidence they felt was so compelling on that that they tried to get uh, the UFO and Roswell researchers at the time to uh, to look at it and maybe publish it and try to give them some feedback on it. They were unsuccessful in that. So then that led Bob Durant then to make his own uh, Roswell documentary, which he created in the in the early 90s. And so there's lots of stuff there, but nothing conclusive. As I recall, uh, Bob Durant's documentary about Roswell was praised by Steven Spielberg. Yes, yes. Oh, you know, great praise that is. I think he said it's the be- one of the best documentaries at that time he'd seen on he'd seen on Roswell. I think it's fair to say that the entire remote viewing community developed a fascination with uh, UFOs going back to at least as far back as the 1990s, if not earlier. Yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, there's so much evidence that's coming out about all this now. It's a uh... It's a very interesting time to be alive because we're seeing, I think we're seeing a big, big convergence of what we're doing with remote viewing and, you know, telepathy and all kinds of psychic skills and the, uh, and the admittance from our governments on earth that there, there's definitely something going on with non-human intelligences. It's very interesting. Ingo in his 1992 article was really complaining, and and I think in the 93 article as well, that the UFO researchers in general don't want to have anything to do with the paranormal, with the psychic. And parapsychologists, for their part, in general, don't want to have anything to do with the UFO enigma. It's as if these two areas of you could call it parascience, are both so threatened, struggling so hard to achieve a level of respectability and inroads into the establishment that they're afraid to deal with each other. And Ingo seemed to feel that this is holding everything back. Yeah, yeah, it was it was pretty bad uh, in the early days, you know, in the in the 80s and the 90s. I believe things have changed now. Uh, a lot of the top, uh, what I would call uh, UFO researchers out there, are using the services of uh, remote viewers to aid in, in their research. I know Linda Moulton Howe, for example, uh, has used uh, many remote viewers, including Joe McMoneagle on projects. So I believe it's, it's, it's working together now. The funny thing is, in the 80s and 90s, uh, well, I say in the 90s onwards, really, remote viewing had a lot of really good credibility because of its 20 year you know stargate history whereas ufos uh had a really bad kind of uh, day in the press you know people anyone that said they were into ufos they were looked at at even more of a kook the strange thing is it's kind of turned on its head now because of the tic tac nimitz uh, explosion of data ufos has become really acceptable nowadays and they don't, the UFO researchers and the people that are looking at UFOs don't like remote viewing to be commu- you know, communicated in, in, the same, in the same terms as you, what we call, not UFOs anymore, we're using the new term UAPs. They don't like U- remote viewing and UAPs to be used in the same sentence anymore because they feel that their topic is now more uh, credible, whereas remote viewing isn't. Yeah, so, so the tables are turned, but there are people out there working together. I think uh, I think we're getting there, and the, you know there are people which are using, I would say, slightly. Uh, they they call what they're doing uh, CE five remote viewing. Uh, Stephen Greer, for example, I don't think it's remote viewing what he's doing, but he is trying to communicate with non human intelligences in a, in an intuitive manner, and that's getting a lot of traction as well. So. Lots, lots, lots are happening out there. Yes, it, I think they are working together. Well, my own philosophy, Daz, is that the human race is not going to enter the galactic community of uh, interstellar travelers until we are able to master our own minds, until we can 
plummet the depths of parapsychology until we understand the connection between the afterlife and the uh, alien community, because there are many examples of aliens and deceased humans appearing together in uh, various abduction accounts. What do you think of that? For 25 years, I've tried to work out what's happening in there, and I did start off with UFO research before I even looked at uh, remote viewing. And before I looked at, uh, even before I looked at UFO research, I spent many years uh, looking at what I call classical psychic techniques. So that's clairvoyance and medium in healing, tarot reading, all that kind of stuff. And I have to say, um, the more I look at all this, the more confounded I am by what I'm finding. I think, uh, it was once described to me by a non-human uh, communication in a, in a channeling session I had that the entire uh, universe that we're trying to look at, and Earth as well at the center of this, uh, is like a giant onion. And it's got all these layers, and at each layer of this giant onion, there are all these different uh, entities uh, trying to communicate, and not you know not just and not how we think of things in black and white. You know, there's lots of shades of grey here. You know, some of them had different intentions for us than we would like, but some of them had beautiful intentions for us. But yeah, so they were just trying to show me one day that it was just this huge big onion of many layers that was trying to unpeel and you have to look at all the different layers to try to work out what's going on in other words the situation is so complex that we have a hard time e even finding words for it absolutely and you know that goes through all of the psychic experiences i've ever had it when you have a true psychic experience and then you try to communicate that to someone in words and pictures you can only do half a job and i think uh I think that's the the issue they have with us. They're trying to communicate the the wonderful vastness and beauty of all this, um, and there just aren't words for it, really. Uh, and then, as I said, 24 years of doing pure remote viewing now, I'm at the conclusion that it feels like there's a force or or uh, a living entity of some kind behind the remote viewing process. Because every time I myself or people I know feel like they've they've got somewhere and we've got it down pat and we know the answers the very next day it's turned on its head and it's almost like there's this trickster in the universe that just just likes to keep us guessing like we're we're just not ready yet to know know the answers that we uh we're seeking a lot of the work you're doing and we touched on it briefly early on in the area of financial forecasting is similar to my way of thinking i've engaged in financial forecasting and the markets are intelligent and when you begin to uh, find a pattern in the markets or find a way of predicting future trends in the markets the markets themselves will adjust to to that so uh, anytime you think you've got a handle on the markets the markets have a handle on you and the i think the same thing is true with uh, the et situation and looking out at the universe in general it's intelligent it knows that we're watching yeah absolutely and you know i've been i've been targeted on many uh, ufo type uh, uh projects myself you know all, mainly done blindly and for example, one of them I did for the Farsight Institute was a blind remote viewing of the Phoenix Lights incident that happened in the in the 90s, where this massive triangle shaped craft hovered over the city of Phoenix for several hours and was photographed and videoed from you know different points all over the city. And whilst I was doing that in a remote viewing session years later, um, kind of trying to penetrate the craft and look around inside to get a feel for it, uh, myself and the other remote viewers on the team did have a Commu you know, a, a communication kind of dialogue with the uh, with the non-humans that were were yeah in that craft, um, and it, so it happens all the time, and it's it's very hard to communicate to other people what the uh, the type of experience you you have with the with these entities because it's hard enough them trying to communicate with us as as, as humans what they're what they're experiencing and what they're trying to do. Uh, and then us trying to get that through a very small uh, bandwidth of consciousness ourselves down onto a sheet of paper uh, makes it even even harder still. But it's, I have to say to people, you know, it's an amazing thing and it's a beautiful thing to uh, to be involved with. Well, I'm under the impression that Ingo himself was very 
much leaning towards the work of Zechariah Sitchin and other writers who who talk about uh, non-humans having a very, very ancient influence on the development of human civilization. And if I recall correctly, Sitchin suggests that we were originally created through genetic engineering to be used as a race of slaves to engage in mining operations in behalf of these, let's call them ETs, extraterrestrials, uh, whether or not that's actually the case. But it would seem as if whatever uh, was going on with regard to using humans as uh, slaves in their minds, that's, that ended a long, long time ago. The human race has evolved a great deal since then. And maybe we're evolving to a point where we can begin to think of these vastly superior creative beings as, at least at some level, our equals. I'm not sure at equal at this stage, um, because if so, then if the abduction events that are happening, um, I I have a feel that if they treat if they wanted to treat us as equals, then they wouldn't forcibly abduct some people. Um, I feel that that's kind of negative, but at the same time. You know, if we feel like we're doing good to animals in the wild that we feel that have a problem, then we essentially go out and, you know, tranquilize and abduct them and, and help them out. So it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a hard situation. It really is. Uh, I don't really understand what's going on with it. I'm not sure Ingo did as well from, you know, from all the files that I've read because he did have the, he, I feel his, his viewpoint did flip flop back and forth over the years, you know, uh, his early 1993 and 1992 article are vastly different, I think, from his experiences that he had in 99 when he, when, you know, when he went back to the moon for this final time and had these conversations. Um, it's, yes, it's a very complex situation. And I also believe that we're probably talking about a multitude of different non-humans here as well so sometimes we you know we get a bit uh as humans we get a bit looking at things black and white and we think of, you know we maybe just think about non-humans as, as the greys or or the tall ones tall nordic looking ones and i think it's a, a vast even more more complex to, than all that you know so yes it's it's just so complex but yeah at the same time it's it, i still believe it's a beautiful thing and i think we're we are on the cusp, you know, with all the revelations that's coming out, and I know there's more uh, because I've been talking to some of the people, and I, I've also done remote viewing work for some of the uh, some of the people that are uh, involved in the disclosure. Uh, I know that a lot more is coming out, so it's going to be a very interesting time over the next three or four years, I believe. Well, you mentioned that you worked with the Farsight Institute, and uh, uh, of course, the Farsight Institute was involved in a scandal or a crisis in which, you know, they reported certain observations they believed to be true. It led other people who learned of their reports to commit one of those horrible mass suicides many, many uh, years ago. But it's it still, I think, serves as a warning for people to be cautious about how they interpret these remote viewing events. Absolutely yes, uh, and you know, with 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 all the projects I I put out to people, I try to put out a caveat. You know, people should should be wary of the information. They should only use remote viewing information with other forms of remote viewing, uh, not remote viewing. Sorry, other forms of information, um, and you should always look for feedback for the projects as well. Um, the stuff that far far as I did, you know, that we're we're talking about the hell bop incident going back into the uh, to the late nineties. I've spoken to, to Courtney about that many times. Um, he seems to believe that because they were at a volatile time where remote viewing was only just becoming public, uh, and yeah, that he was, he believes he was duped into that, and it was some kind of intelligence campaign to make Farsight look bad. I I don't know on this. I've I've tried to find out what happened uh, during that time. I did also speak to the people involved uh, at Heaven's Gate um, about all this and about the the effect remote viewing might have had on it. And they were they made it absolutely clear to me that uh, they uh, for a, at least a decade before the uh, Farsight 
predictions of the Hellbot Comet, they they had already made up their mind a decade before that they were going to uh, leave the planet by a, a mass suicide attempt. Um, so they t- they they assured me that the remote viewing had no no influence on their decision on that. Thank you for informing me and our viewers about that little piece of information. It sheds a, a completely different light on a, a very troubling episode. Yes. Well, Daz, I'm very delighted to have had this conversation with you. I know that your knowledge of uh, remote viewing is incredibly vast. You've been publishing about it now for a long time, and I look forward to having future conversations. I'm sure there's a great deal more that we can explore. Yeah, it's been fantastic. Uh, and, you know, I admire the work you're doing. Your, your videos are some of the best video resources on, on YouTube and on the Internet. So thank you for having me. For those of you watching and listening, thank you for being with us.